technology can be a beautiful thing. It allows us to do some really incredible things. Yet ironically, it's also contributing to one, some of the biggest impacts we have and the challenges we have with our impact on nature and the environment. Like here, on the Pearl River Delta in China, where we manufacture most of the world's genes, over 200 million genes are manufactured there every year. The process to dye those genes creates a wastewater runoff that ends up in the river, creating toxins, polluting the habitat, effectively destroying the river. It's a massive disaster that happens every single day. This is how we've come to think of technology impacting nature. We know it's not a good thing. We know we want to change it. But how do we do it? Well, maybe we can do it by stop thinking about just how technology impacts nature, but also how nature impacts technology. We get most of our great new ideas by observing the natural world around us from nature. We take those new ideas, we innovate on what we've done before to create new technology. How that technology impacts nature is determined on how we use it. And maybe we can do a little bit better by reminding ourselves where the original inspiration for that technology comes from. Because nature is inspiring new technology all the time. For example, the latest in breathable waterproof clothing is being developed based on naturally water repellent structures called hydrophilic structures on the surface of leaves, specifically the surface of leaves found on lotus flower plants. The same physics that allows ancient stained glass to peer out and transmit these beautiful colors, which is due to tiny little metallic nanoparticles naturally formed in the glass, is inspiring a whole generation of plasmonic biosensors that will allow us to sequence DNA in the palm of our hand cheaply, efficiently, and will completely revolutionize the way that we are able to do medical diagnostics. Even on our money, in 2009, when I was a graduate student, I had a project to develop a new authentication feature for banknotes. The idea was to create a high-definition display powered just by ambient light that would turn images on and off, that would fit on the surface of the thread, the security thread of the banknote, which is about two millimeters in size. The challenge here was to develop a pixel small enough to create a high resolution display. And on two millimeters, that means we have to create a pixel that's the size of one micron or one microbiner. And even today, the latest smartphone technologies are using pixels that are 70 times that size. To give you an idea of how small that is, I want you to imagine a crayon. Now imagine the tip of that crayon, which is also about two millimeters in size. Now, if we want to create a one micrometer pixel, let's not think about pixels. Let's think about letters. If we wanted to write a letter the size of one micrometer, we could fit up to 800,000 words, not letters, words, on the tip of that crayon. That's equivalent to about 3,200 pages of written text, all on the tip of the crayon. That's like if we took the Lord of the Rings, ripped every page out, laid it out in front of us, and shrunk it down so that the whole thing could fit onto the tip of a single crayon. Try to imagine that for a moment. It's pretty hard. It's equally as hard to try to imagine how we're going to engineer a pixel to create a color display that size. And it wasn't like we could just take what had been done before and scale it down. Because at one micrometer, that means the sub-pixels, the things that make up the pixel, the red, green, and blue colors, would actually be smaller than a wavelength of light. And the structures we're familiar with, physics tells us, they're not going to interact with light at that scale. They're just going to absorb it and not be able to transmit anything useful back to us. So we needed, and we started to look for some sort of example, maybe somewhere in nature, something that's already using structures that can sort of magically interact with light at that scale. That same year in 2009, I was able to take a trip to Costa Rica for my honeymoon. Well, my wife and I, we were hiking in the jungle in Costa Rica. We 
climbed up this uh, dormant volcano, and right at the top of this volcano, we ran into a whole bunch of these beautiful blue butterflies, and I managed to take a quick snapshot of one of them. What struck me about this, these butterflies were that even though we were in this dark jungle underneath this thick canopy where not a lot of light was able to reach down to the bottom, these wings on the butterflies were super bright. They almost shimmered in this kind of metallic, iridescent way without much ambient light to reflect off of. Sort of what we wanted to do with this authentication feature for banknotes. So when I came back, I started doing a little bit of research. I found out that this particular butterfly, it's called the blue morpho. And what's special about the blue morpho is that unlike most butterflies and insects that create their color from pigments, which are similar to how we actually dye our genes, it's sort of like a painted on color. The blue morpho's wings are actually transparent. And what causes the color are tiny nanostructures on the wing of the butterfly that absorb the light and are able to just transmit the blue spectrum back. So finally we had that example of, ah, this is maybe how a sub-wavelength tiny nanostructure can interact with light in a useful way for us to create colors. Just by using the different kinds of structures. And so, we tried to make something similar. We couldn't make the exact same thing because the structures were far too complex to actually build. But we could come close, and after some trial and error and working out the size of these structures and the spacing and the geometries, we were able to actually recreate colors similar to the blue morpho. And eventually we found by controlling those parameters, we could actually create just about any color we wanted and engineer nanoscale pixels to create macro scale colors that we can see and put into banknotes and create one of the most robust security features we have today. Because we now understood how something that could be that small can effectively work to create colors. All because of this butterfly. It's hard to imagine that we would have been nearly as successful as we were without having this sort of very specific particular butterfly as an example, a point of reference for us to understand how this physics can work. A year after I came back from Costa Rica, the UN put out a study in 2010 showing that 150 to 200 species go extinct every day. That's almost 70,000 species every year. And as a scientist and engineer, I, that kind of struck me as you know, it's a horrible thing, but it, it's also 200 opportunities that we're losing every single day to learn something new, to be inspired and create something new. And it made me start to think a little bit differently about the technology we, we had developed for this banknote. It made me start thinking a little bit more about things like what was happening on the Pearl River Delta. I mean, what have we really done with this banknote technology? We effectively created a collar by just creating structures on the surface of a material where there was no color. I mean, wouldn't it be nice if we could color our jeans and clothing just by putting structures into the cotton instead of dyeing it and causing this destruction which is contributing to the extinction of these kinds of animals. So we tried it and we found that actually, yeah, we can. We can create a metal stamp with these nanostructures on top of it and actually imprint the cotton. And what you're looking there on the right-hand side, or left-hand side, is a picture of, a photograph of a cotton t-shirt, white cotton t-shirt that we actually applied some pressure to with this stamp, and we're able to turn the color from white to green. On the right-hand side, you can see a scanning electron microscope image, magnified by 10,000 times. You can see those little tiny nanocolor pixels embossed into the structure of the cotton. We didn't add anything to the cotton. We just restructured the surface. If we can do that on cotton, maybe we can do it on other things as well. Does anybody have an idea what this might be? I think I heard hair out there. Yeah, this is a photograph or a, an image of a human hair magnified 5,000 times under an electron microscope. You can see, and you probably can recognize now, those nanoscale pixels. We were actually able to stamp that into those, to the hair. Again, adding nothing to the hair. 
and we're able to color the hair any color we want, red, blue, yellow, green, and hopefully sometime soon we'll actually create a device that we can color our hair, like a hair strainer where we just apply a little heat, a little pressure, and color our hair without using toxic, harmful dyes. It shows us that technology can be beautiful, and it can be better. It can be better for us, it can be better for nature and the environment. And we need to do better. We need to do better so that we can keep nature in this picture, in this cycle. So if we don't, we lose the opportunity and the, the chance that we can innovate and continue to create these new technologies that benefit us. So next time you're out for a walk in the outdoors, take a look around you at the beauty of the natural environment and see if you can't see something there that might inspire you to do a little better. So we all have to do a little better. Otherwise, we risk losing this. That natural environment might not be around for very much longer. But the good news is, if we're clever, we can be better. <laughs>